Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you, it's nice to meet you. Um, I don't work here, but I do attend here with my family. There's a picture of my family that's about to pop up. Um, that's my husband, Jonathan. He does work here. He's the executive pastor, and those are our kids. And that's our favorite place. Um, and the people who also know that place know that that's the VIX in North Chai Lai, the ice cream shop across from Roberts. And most nights that we don't have soccer and it's not raining, that's where we go. That's like, that's my favorite place. And I know that some of you are going to helpfully try to stop me in the lobby and tell me that I can get a whole carton of ice cream for $3 at Wegmans. And I do know that, but it doesn't taste good if I scoop it. It loses all the flavor. So, um, so that's where we are. We really like ice cream and we're there most nights. You can come say hi to us. Uh, in addition to liking going out for ice cream, I like to read. I've always liked to read, like since I was a kid. Um, and I have developed a unfortunate habit with novels that I've done since like middle school, where when I start a book, I read the first like one or two chapters. I figure out who the characters are and what the basic plot is. And then I read the end to see if I'm gonna like it. Because if I don't really like how the author's gonna end it, I'm not committed to the book. Like, I don't wanna get my heart into these people and then be mad about it. So there was this one book that people had recommended to me, and it was excellent. It was a really good book. It was called um, Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers. It's a historical fiction book, but it's a rewrite of the book of Hosea, but set in the California Gold Rush. It was a really good book, and I had like committed to myself that I was going to read it like page by page and not read the end, like normal people do. And I did, but I had to know how it ended. And I finished it at three o'clock in the morning on a school day, and I'm a teacher. So at 5.30 that morning, my alarm went off and I got up and went and educated the future of America. And it was not a day where the taxpayers got a very good deal. <laughs> I was not a great version of myself. But I, I get like super stuck on that question. Does it have a good ending? Am I gonna like the ending? Like how does the story end? And that's actually the question that we're talking about today, but from the Bible, how does the story end? Is it a good ending? In Christian worlds, they call this like the conversation about the end times, how the world ends, what happens at the end. And it's kind of a hot topic and people like to debate it. And today we're gonna be reading the passage in the book of Matthew where Jesus talks about the end of the world with his disciples. And followers of Jesus tend to fall into two camps. When we're talking about the end of the world, there's people who are really interested in this topic and they will spend hours and days studying it and thinking about it and talking about it. And then there's some people who quietly prefer that none of that was in the Bible and try to skim past it when they get there. So I'm, I'm over here. I'm kind of camp number two, but obsession and denial are not generally healthy responses. And really anything that Jesus said is worth studying. So here we are. But before we get into it, I want to um, establish some ground rules for talking about the end of the world according to the Bible before I get to the passage part. So ground rule one, I am not going to give you any answers about the end of the world. That is because I would have to make them up. People who tell you that they have very specific information about the end of the world are probably selling you something. Jesus says later in the chapter we're reading today in Matthew 24 that actually no one knows when Jesus is coming back, not even the angels. So the guy standing on the corner with the big pictures of fire yelling at you, he doesn't know either. And it used to be a real concern for me that I didn't have answers um, for mysteries 
uh, about anything related to faith, but about the end of the world too, because I got stuck on these fragments I had heard from the Bible, like from 1 Peter 3.15 that says, always be prepared to give an answer. And I don't have any answers about a lot of mysteries, including this one. And I thought maybe if I knew more, like if I had more information, I could convince other people to love Jesus. But when, you, when I stretch out that section that I got stuck on, always be prepared to give an answer, the whole section from 1 Peter 13 says, in your hearts set apart Christ Jesus as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So I cannot give you specific answers for your questions about the end of the world but I would love to tell you the reason why I have hope, because his name is Jesus. And gentleness and respect is the tone that I'm looking for today in this conversation. We might actually disagree on how to interpret this passage. It's really challenging. And I'm not gonna try to sound smart or interesting. I'm just gonna try to show you that there's hope every time Jesus talks or does anything, even when he's talking about the end of the world. Ground rule number two, the end of the story, which is what we're talking about today, only makes sense when you're looking at the whole big story. All by itself, it will seem bizarre. In school, we call this like a narrative arc, like a story begins and then it builds and it builds and it hits a climax and then it comes down and it resolves. So all of scripture is telling the big story of God and humanity. So it opens in the Garden of Eden where God has made this beautiful orderly world. And then there's this tragic twist where sin and pain and death enter the world that God made. And then this story of God saving humans keeps building all the way through the history of Israel and the law and the prophets. And it hits the climax where Jesus arrives on earth as God to save his people. And this part is the climax where Jesus lives and dies and comes back to life. And then we enter the part of human history where we live, which is sometimes called like the church age or I've heard it called the already, but the not yet. Like we've seen God in the person of Jesus and we have the full access to forgiveness and the Holy Spirit, but we are actually day to day still living in a world that's being slowly ripped apart by sin and pain. Now the very last chapter of human history, which Christians have affirmed for thousands of years based on the New Testament texts. This is, this is the ending, this is the great restoration. This is when the full fulfillment of everything God designed comes. It's the return of Jesus as the true king and the good judge and life in the kingdom of God according to the plans of God. That's the big ending. The Nicene Creed says, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. So the end of the story only makes sense when we're looking at the big story of God saving humanity. And ground rule number three, the world is going to end. And I probably should have led with that, but I just want to explain that no reasonable human thinks that the situation we have on earth right now is infinite. Like scientifically, that doesn't even make sense. We exist within time. Time is a created entity. Time, is, time as we know it is completely based on the way the earth spins and then the way the earth travels around the sun. And you know from fifth grade science that the sun is a star and stars burn out. It's not imminent. You don't need to sell stock or baseball cards. But it's not like weird doomsday talk to acknowledge that this situation is not infinite. Actually, BBC Science runs some really interesting, like speculative, what scientists think it will look like when the end of the world as we know it happens. And the difference in having this conversation here is that for people of faith listening to Jesus talk about the end of the world, there's actually a lot of reason for hope. When Jesus talks about the end of the world, it teaches us good and healthy information and it's worthwhile. So now we're actually gonna read the scripture 
And I realize that some of you are thinking like, is she ever gonna finish setting this up? But then I'm gonna read it and you're gonna be like, yeah, she probably should have set that up more. <laughs> it's from um, Matthew 24. And we're gonna read verses one through 14 and then 27 through 31. So it opens on a conversation between Jesus and his disciples as they're walking by the temple. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all those, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? And they wanted that like specific answer, when? Nope. And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my namesake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. We're gonna skip ahead to verse 27, so you're home by dinner. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. That's Jesus referring to himself. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. I probably read that 462 times preparing for today um, because you see like it, it's, it's difficult to understand. And there's a couple things that I feel like I learned from all of that reading and studying that I'd like to share with you. The first thing looking at verse one and two is that this situation is temporary. The passage actually opened with Jesus and his disciples walking by the temple. And they're like discussing the building as you would discuss like a big fancy building you were walking by. And Jesus tells them that temple is actually going to be so utterly destroyed that you won't even have multiple stones standing on each other anymore. Now for them, that temple, that was an ancient building that was so critical to their national identity. It was part of their religious identity and their ethnic identity. It seemed like almost eternal. It was the most significant thing in place that they could imagine. And Jesus was saying, even that, even that is temporary. There's not even gonna be two stones on top of each other. Everything we can see and touch doesn't last forever. And we all want to trust something we can see and touch. And we all want the comfort of believing in something we can see and touch. Like, like I'm, I'm who I am because of this person or I can watch the numbers in my bank account grow, or I can go to the job where I feel competent. But even the sturdiest thing we have on earth is not actually permanent. The temple they were discussing in this passage was actually destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman army. So it didn't even last another 50 years. 
Um, the Apostle Paul wrote about this tension that we have between the tangible things and spiritual things in his letter in 2 Corinthians in verse four, or chapter four, verse 17 to 18. He wrote, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. For faithful Jewish people, losing the temple wouldn't have felt like a light trouble. It would have felt like a total identity. Like, who are we without that? But I know that question. Who am I without? Have you ever felt that? Because I've had different things in that blank at different parts of my life. Who am I without that person? Who am I without that job? Who am I without that place? But everything you can see and touch is temporary. Nothing is forever except the things we can't actually see. The Spirit of God, how much He loves us and His grace, and our own deepest human souls, which can connect to Him. It's only the unseen that's truly permanent. Another thing I learned from reading this passage is that the world is going to roll on towards the end, full of natural disaster, conflict, war, and persecution of the church. Here's the thing. I read the news every day, and reading the news is overwhelming. Last February, there was an earthquake in Turkey right by the Syrian border and there were almost 60,000 confirmed deaths from that one event. And I sat there for like a week reading the news and trying to think about that many lives that were gone in an instant. And it was too much to really process. And every day we're waking up and people all over the globe are waking up to war and conflict. You know, I teach third graders. So I teach eight-year-olds. And I had two students this year who had to leave their home countries because of war and terror. And they weren't even from the same continent. They were from two different conflicts. They are so little that I still have to double knot their shoes for PE. And they are starting over. They've lost their extended families. They've lost their schools, their home language, their food, everything. One of my little friends, um, who came this year, when, he, when they left their home country and were flying over the ocean, he left his suitcase unzipped two inches so that his teddy bear could breathe. That's how little they are. And they're losing everything because of the greed and evil actions of adults where they live. And they're the lucky ones because they lived. And when you think about that, or when I think about that, I get a stomach ache. And so, personally, I found it very helpful to listen to Jesus describe here the truth about how things really are on this planet. It's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquake and famine. And it made me think, I'm not crazy that I'm upset, that I'm watching the world unravel and all these people made in the image of God in unthinkable pain. Like Jesus acknowledged that this is where we live, and this is what's happening. A lot of it, not all of it, but is what parents would call natural consequences. Like what's happening is a result of the choices that humans made. We planted the seeds, we did what we wanted, and this is what grew. Another thing I learned, a little more hopeful, um, is that even through the intense suffering and persecution, enduring, is possible, and the gospel goes forward. And I'm actually gonna put the verses back up because this is my favorite part. Verse 13 says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So endure is the goal. Endure basically means hang in there. You do not have to be super strong, super smart, or a spiritual superhero to endure. Enduring is attainable by grace 
through faith to anybody who holds on to Jesus. And that is really great news. Jesus is saving us just like he has been the whole story. All we have to do is hang on and endure. And when Jesus says, talks about enduring to the end, it made me think of another passage in Ephesians that Christians talk about. They call it the, um, the armor of God passage because it goes over like different spiritual protections. It's from another letter um, Paul wrote, this one to the church in Ephesus. And that section ends with chapter six, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. There's a mistaken idea that the reason we needed spiritual armor is because we were gonna go on the offensive. That we were gonna attack the lies and defeat the evil and slay the dragon and defend the truth. But St. Augustine said, the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose, it will defend itself. All that armor that Paul talked about in Ephesians 6, our faith, our truthfulness, right living, the salvation of God, peace and scripture, all that armor was to help us endure, as Jesus said, or to stand, as Paul said. I know there's people who worry a lot that they haven't done great things for God. I've heard that phrase. I have definitely not done great things for God. I don't even make dinner sometimes. <laughs> And that sounds exhausting, that, that being the goal, that I'm gonna do great things for God. And I don't actually think it comes from the Gospels. The, the directions of the Gospels was to love God with everything you are, your mind, your body, your spirit, to love your neighbor as much as you love your own self, and to endure, to hang in there through the hard parts. We don't have to fight and we don't have to win because he's going to win. That's the point. All we really need to know to keep hanging on is that he's saving us and he will win. That piece of truth is a treasure when you're really tired and hanging on is probably all you can do. And then verse 14, which comes right after the one about enduring, says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. The worst parts of this world, which are horrible, the tragedy and the sickness and the violence, all of that was, is gonna be no match for the good news that God is reaching out to humanity. And that's the part we get to participate in. It's our privilege and our mission in our part of human history to bring to everybody the story of Jesus. And can you see when you read that, the heart of Jesus? the good news of the gospel of grace to every human on earth, to every corner of the globe, to every language. I once heard someone describe the gospel, this knowledge that God saves us through Jesus, that the gospel is the true human right, that every person should get that information. Every person should be able to hear and accept it if they choose to. And the worst of this planet cannot stop the gospel going forward. And then another thing I learned is that Jesus is coming back and you won't be able to miss it. And he will gather us together and gather us to himself. There is a strand of Christian theology that believes that the end of this world will come in stages and that some people will be like taken to heaven before others. And I developed a concern that I probably would not be the kind of person who makes it in round one. That would probably be when the good Christians went. And all my friends in the audience are like, amen, she probably wouldn't. <laughs> it's fine. But I, I did develop this concern that I probably wasn't a first round pick. Um, but then reading Reading how Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24, he compares his return to lightning that you can see from all the way in the east and all the way in the west, unmissable. And then he describes a gathering of all of his followers and brought to heaven in this fulfillment of the original plan of God's design, us back together, 
gathered from the ends and us in connection with him. It's the best ending. Uh, worship team, can you look alive and come back? <laughs> so that is the end of the big story. The hero comes back with clarity like lightning and, and he restores our relationships with each other and he completely restores our relationships with God. Does that sound familiar? Of course, because that's how it started. In the Christian creation narrative, the earth is full of God's goodness and humans are at peace with each other and we're at peace with God. And Jesus doesn't give a lot of details, gory details, but he gives a great picture. In the end, it's kind of like a new Eden. Everybody gathered back together, everybody together and everybody with him. So does it help to know that ending according to Jesus? Even if you're not like me and you don't read the end first, I think this time it does. Because the whole story was only ever about one thing. The whole story is about that God saves us. God was saving us through faith and covenant in the Abraham stories. God was saving us from famine in the Joseph stories. God was saving his people from slavery in the Moses stories. God was trying to save us from ourselves in the law. God was still reaching out to save us through the prophets, trying to give people a way back home. And then God saved us fully in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we still, he's still giving us the Holy Spirit to save us on the regular. And in the end, God saves us. That's the ending. And when you know that, you still have a reason to hope, even when it's incredibly hard right now. So I got to help pick the song that they're ending with today. The last time I spoke in church, my message was about handling conflict. And my song suggestion was Katy Perry's fight song. This is my fight song. Yeah, no, and they said no. <laughs> but, but they let me try again this time because Christians and Grace. Um, and this song, this is one of my favorite songs. And I love it because this song tells the big story. It's gonna start here in Eden and build it all the way through and end where we were today reading what Jesus says is the end of the story, that he comes back and that he gathers us together and that we're back with him and the people that we loved, that we lost, and we're living with Jesus in a world with no pain. It ends with angels and glory and trumpets, and it ends with God saving us. So for this song, um, we're gonna actually have them sing it but they're gonna have the words on the screen so that you can read it and think, and you can stay sitting and relax and um, listen. Thank you.